Well, good afternoon. My name is Maria Meyer. I'm the director of the Museums Almeida Museum. Uh, this evening we'll speak in English uh, in honor to our very distinguished guest, Christopher Payne. And let me start by thanking the public, all of you. It's very nice to see some friendly faces, familiar colleagues and uh, friends. And so thank you so much for coming. Uh, we had a lot of people that got COVID, so it's very unfortunate. And well, we wish them well. <laughs> it's a great, great pleasure to introduce tonight our guest, Christopher Payne. I know he needs no introduction, but Christopher uh, is devoted to furniture of his life, and uh, so his devotion speaks for himself. He has been dedicated to 19th century British and French furniture, right? Uh, he is a renowned English specialist, researcher, <coughs> author, and he has worked at Sotheby's for almost 25 years. He became the head of the furniture department. And he's a very fam familiar face in Britain and all over the world because he joined the famous show, Antiques Roadshow, uh, BBC Roadshow. And uh, so back in 1985, so he worked there for almost 30 years, so everybody knows him. The roadshow was on Portuguese television, so we know it deeply. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as I told you, Christopher is the author of several books, and one of the works he published back in 2003 focuses on one of the cabinet makers that is represented here in the collection of the Medellis Yalmeda collection. Uh, and which will be one of the subjects of this evening's discussion entitled Transvali. Just for a short notice, we first came in touch with Christopher through his wife, Ellen Jacobson. She's a curator at the Wallace Collection, I'm sorry, <laughs> couldn't help it. And she also is also present here tonight. Uh, in 2013, they both visited the museum, and from then on, we've been uh, we've seen some of our pieces published in the books. So more recently, he, uh, Christopher was generous enough to provide us with some precious information about uh, two more pieces that were in uh, in storage that we ex exhibited nowadays at the museum. You know that whenever we contact foreign researchers, they are very, very generous with information, sharing information. That is really, really generous from researchers. Well, the talk this evening is entitled A Belle Epoque Treasure House. Thank you for the mm -hmm. title. <laughs> Furniture at the Medellis Almeida Museum. And it will be dedicated to our 19th century furniture and some more pieces of information. Thank you for your generosity and in suggesting to come and do this presentation. The okay. floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. That's very nice. Um, I'm um, going to stand up and walk around. I can't sit down. I'm not reading notes. So if I made a mistake, will you let me know in something? I remember always complaining to people there was no furniture by Francois Linke in any museum in the world, as far as I knew. And I can't remember how, but somebody said to me, but have you ever been to the Casa Almeida, Museo Almeida? I can't. First, no, let me say, uh, forgive me for not speaking Portuguese um, tonight. Uh, I don't think you'd like that at all. But so, and, and so I'd never been there, and, or here. And I arrived with Helen, and I simply could not believe what I was seeing in this museum. It really is a treasure house. I'm talking about the Belle Epoque. Uh, the Belle Epoque, when is that? Well, roughly 1885 to the First World War, 1914. There's no real, it's not, a tie, it's not like a, uh, the reign of a king or something like that. It's a vague thing, but it certainly stopped by the First World War. And there are some really, really important pieces here. And not only French, but also some very, very good English pieces. And that's another story. So um, I want to take you through this. Um, and I think what we'll, we'll start with this slide. So I, the slide, it'll be in three sections. It's only about uh, two hours each section. So, um, but what I think, why don't we, it, it'll be quite clear when I have a break. So it'll, it'll say section two. 
And I really do encourage you, don't be shy. If you want to ask a question, if you ask a question, if you think of a question now, or at least when I'm in a lecture listening, slide one, I have a question. So I spend the whole evening <laughs> worrying about the question. And um, so why don't you, if you want, we'll have a little, not a break, but just stop for a second. And if you have a question about that section, we can go back to the slide or just describe it. So it make it hopefully more intimate and more of a discussion rather than me standing reading from notes and you know, making you all fall asleep. My job is not to let you fall asleep. <laughs> so the first section is copies. Now I know that is a really, really bad word in most academic circles. I wrote my first book in 1981 and I was talking about copies then. And somebody said to me, why are you talking about copies? It'll ruin your career. <laughs> well, I'm still doing it. Um, uh, so this is not a copy as such. This is a very important piece of furniture bought by the British government for a museum instead of tax at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. Uh, by André Charboul, um, who's you know, a very, I'm sorry about the accent, he's a very, very important maker, and all of this uh, inlaid furniture, what you see with brass, um, if it's uh, got the sea, the sea turtle, and do remember, it's not, sea, uh, it's not turtle, tortoise shell, it's turtle shell. Turtle shell. Everybody calls it tortoise, I don't know why. Um, just one of those old-fashioned ideas. But what's interesting about this is, it was bought, um, this is really what set the scene for England. The King George IV um, in 1820, he was beginning to buy, or even when he was Prince Regent in 1810, was beginning to buy French furniture after the revolution. He was sending people, agents over, and they were bringing it back to England. And it became very, very fashionable. This is an original piece by Bull. But if you think that Bull was working in, let's say, 1700, uh, why has it got these strange Egyptian stand, supports? because they were added in England for the English market. Of course, remember, we got the French out of the Battle of the Nile. The French were forced out of Egypt. The English were there, and uh, Nelson, etc. And so we became very interested in, in the Egyptian style, and that's a, another new lecture. But so that's been added, and that's quite normal. The, many of these cabinets have lost their base. But look at this. Everything in blue there has been replaced. So it did have, this is all how it would have looked in the 18th century, in, the, in 1700, but all of the blue uh, brass has been replaced because it was uh, completely fallen apart. So that was done in, we think, about 1820 when this piece was sold to a very famous English collector. So it's all been replaced. So it's not a copy, but it's been very drastically altered. Uh, oops. So we move on to a real piece of bull. Um, now you'll notice here there's a, a little Portuguese flag just hiding in the corner. Every piece which is actually from this museum, I've marked with that rather than saying the whole thing, which is too complicated for me to write every time, a little uh, Portuguese flag to show this is here. This one is another version in England at a very important house called Knoll in, in Kent in England, part of the National Trust. Knoll believed that this one is the original 18th century, and they didn't know about this one. But very careful inspection um, by people, I, uh, friends I know, uh, and when I saw it here, it was quite obvious. I went to see this because of this lecture about a month ago. It's quite clearly a 19th century copy, quite clearly. This on the left, you see the little flag. This is the back of the one here. The French cabinet makers in about 1700 they were making the, it was really quite poor quality, the back of the back. All they wanted was to show, it wanted to look good, the stage set, if you like. Um, but by the 19th century in England, um, they're much, much better quality. And you notice one particular thing. This is local wood of some sort, probably um, almost pine, possibly. This is, do you know this wood? Mahogany. Mahogany was not being used in the, until roughly 1730 or 40 at the earliest. So this piece couldn't have been made in mahogany by bull, just impossible. So that is the first thing that you, you want to look at. Uh, this is very difficult to read, but on this, it's a name called Wertheimer, Wertheimer, who was a very well-known Jewish antique dealer and collector, and buying for some of the rich, rich aristocrats in England in the 1830-40 period. 
Now, I haven't put flags on this one. Um, which, is the 18th, which is the bull one of 1700, and which is the copy? Somebody's got it right. Which is what? Origin, original left, yes. And it's, 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 it's got a bit more spirit to it. It's not only the condition, of course, because this is, you know, it's much, much older, but it's got more spirit. This is a bit sort of, I don't know, it doesn't quite have the same feeling to it. And I think if you, if you draw a tree, let's say you ask a child or anyone draws a tree, a big oak tree like that, in pencil, then you say, right, now copy that. It's never going to be quite the same. And I think that's the answer. There's always a slight difference. It's not easy to understand sometimes. So, same thing here. Sorry about this slide. I couldn't get it to work properly. But you can see again quite clearly um, the, the difference in, in, in the texture and the feeling. And part of it is the fact it's the, the deterioration, but it is that cutting, the way it's cut. And the way that this bra brass is done, the marquetry, I don't know if you know about it. I'll show you some slides later. It's amazingly complicated and skilled. So now we're back to, uh, well, on the left to the museum here, and on the right, the Wallace collection. So these are copies, that horrible word copies, that awful word that people use, copy. I think that copies should be celebrated. Um, if we go back to the clock at Noel, I should have said that. Noel still believed that their long bull clock is, a, is 18th century. They will not admit that it's a copy. And when I went there, I said, look, you should celebrate this. It's a really important thing. One of the richest men in Europe in the 1850s had copies made, the Marcus of Hartford. His collection is now the Wallace collection. So his, actually his name, it was his son, Sir Richard Wallace, who actually gave his name to the museum. So this is, this is the, uh, well, these are both the copies. So he had two copies made. He had 16 pieces made altogether in 1853. And he had two of these made, one, for Paris on the left, which is the one you've got, and one for London on the right. He had two houses, two copies, why not? But the one here in the museum is a very superior and very unusual one for various reasons. Oh, sorry. The back of this one is, has marquetry like this, so it's all brass inlaid. You can't really see it easily, it's on the top of the staircase. But it's very, very unusual to do that. So presumably Lord Hartford, the Marquis of Hartford, wanted it in Paris, in his Rue Lafitte apartments, so uh, perhaps in the middle of the room, so he could work and, and so it could be seen from the back. Whereas the one in the Wallace collection, I don't have a photograph of it, it's just a, a plain oak back, very, very nicely made, beautifully made. Generally speaking, the 19th century copies or 19th century furniture is better made than most 18th century furniture. It's a bit of a generalization, but uh, uh, generally speaking, um, this is very, I've got two of these. <laughs> when I came here the first time, uh, I think Samantha showed me, I think we've got a signature on this one, and we were crawling underneath and eventually found this signature, which you can't see, it's impossibly difficult to, to take a photograph, J. Webb, J. Webb. It's the same signature. This is the man who organised the copies to be made for the Marcus of Hartford in 1853. And he had some spectacular copies made, as we'll see. Here's one of them. This is a piece made for the, Com uh, the Count de, Com de Provence uh, by Riesner in 1770. 1800. I can't remember the date. 86. In the 1780s. Um, so this is the original at Windsor Castle in the British Royal Collection. And it was in a very famous video re fairly recently, which you might have seen when Paddington Dare make, met the Queen. It took me about three hours to get this photograph off the internet, but, but that is the original one in the, in the Queen's drawing room at Windsor. So the, the Queen Victoria lent, let's go back to the, the Queen Victoria lent this one to this famous Gore House exhibition in 1853, and John Webb was the organizer of the exhibition, and somehow, with or without permission, we're not sure, was allowed to copy all, the, all of these 16 pieces, which is an extraordinary thing. And it cost millions to do. This one, it's difficult to say, it cost £2,600 in 1853. Well, it's almost impossible to make that into real money today, but many millions of pounds. So here she is. Uh, it's most wonderful, isn't it? Glorious. So, again, which is, <laughs> this is really unfair, which is the copy and which is the original? 
I was lucky enough to buy for a client the copy in the 1990s. And um, we restored it at the time by chance when the royal one it was being restored at Windsor Castle. So I was allowed to take the bronzes along and compare. Well, when you look at this, you can see this is somebody holding the copy, bronzes, and this is the original, original copy. I mean, it's incredible that 80 years later, people were able to copy like this. As far as we know, without, without, this is really important, the original master models. So they had to start from the beginning. I, I just, it's, it's incredible. But not impossible, clearly. So you notice something about this one on the left. This is a photograph of the one uh, in the Wallace collection many years ago, old black and white photograph. And on the right, it's the same one, but notice something has been altered those two uh, vases. So they were missing. When I bought this one in Paris, the one on the left, um, the vases were missing. So, okay, but it's still a very important piece. I mean, I knew they were missing. They weren't, you know, they've been missing for many, many years. What do I do? So I wrote to the Queen, <laughs> um, because I knew there was a precedent in the, 19, in the Queen Victoria allowed something for the Rothschilds to have something copied, but a candlestick. So I said, citing this precedent, precedent can we possibly have... Um, make these copies. Anyway, it happened. <laughs> and there, made in 2002, the pair of copies. Look at the quality of that. We took it to the Queen's jeweler, because I, I wanted to have the, the, one of the vases in my workshop. No, they wouldn't let me. I had to go with a security guard to the Queen's jeweler in Hatton Garden. And they tried to make it, and they spent a lot of money. They could not do it. It was terrible. So I called a friend in Paris, a, a, a bronze restorer. He came along and by eye and a few bits of plaster and caliper and measures, he made the, these. Incredible, absolutely incredible. Um, this is in the museum on the left. What I don't think many people will have seen are these drawings, um, which were done in the um, 1890s. This, the, the original is in the Jones Collection at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And these drawings were made of this and several pieces to allow people to make scale uh, copies, or not scale copies, full-scale copies. So this is, but we don't know who made this one. Uh, we know that a, a maker called Paul Somani made one. This one is not signed. We had it up today, but we can't find the maker's name. But it's incredibly good quality. Uh, but, you know, were they really making from drawings like that? I think they must have been allowed to take moulds using like plasticine type thing as well. This one's in the museum. Um, nobody knew who this was by. It's quite a well-known model. It was made, it's now called the Chanty commode. It was made in the, uh, uh, from about 1850 onwards to about 1920, still being made. It was one of the most popular copies to be ever be made. It's copied after Jean-Henri Riesner the famous maker for um, uh, the Louis XVI and Queen Mary Antoinette, uh, and Helen wrote a book about this uh, last year, about that this, not this commode, but this maker. And um, so this, we, nobody knew who it was by, and there's no way of telling who it was by until it was restored in, here in the museum. And you can just see there, GD. It is a G, I assure you, not a G, uh, not a C. Uh, Gervais Durand. And there are other pieces by Durand in this museum. Now, I'm sure that when it was bought for the uh, house, nobody knew this maker. Even if anyone 50 years ago had taken the bronze mounts off here, they would never have really looked at the, the back to see the marks. But the marks now, we understand, are increasingly important in identifying the maker. So Gervais Durand, a well-known model and you know, great quality. And they do vary, though. This one's a, it's OK, this one. It's not the best, but um, the best is to come. Uh, here is one, so also my favourite man, uh, Francois Linker, he made this one. How did he manage to make it? We know that in 1911, he bought at auction in Paris the master models for this and the plans. And they're all still in the Linker archives, which is a huge archive of thousands of pieces still in a, pri in a private house under my care. Um, so this is the one made by Linker. And he prob and so these moulds were, well, were very expensive and they were passed almost from father to son, sold from, you know, somebody needed some money, one of the makers, he'd sell the moulds to somebody else. It was a, a, a way of trading. And they're very valuable, because, of course, it saves you 
a huge amount of time if you have the original master mold. I won't go into the casting process, it's incredibly complex. Um, so um, this is more things from the Linker archives, just showing, well, we'll just go back to that. You can just see, it's not the same marquetry, but you can see these various bits of inlaid marquetry on this typical French work, incredible quality. And here's a sample from Linker, in Linker's boxes, he could say to a client, do you want this one or this model, or this is what uh, Reasoner did, this is what somebody else did. So it's a, you know, it was a very useful way of showing clients what it might look like in the end. Um, so now we're going to section two. So just have a look at that for a moment. Uh, I don't have any of these books here to sell you. I'm not trying to sell any books. <laughs> it's four years old. It does weigh three and a half kilos, the book, so I'm not going to send you one. Um, but the, so let's just go back. Does anyone want to ask any questions about this the section that we've been through here, all the way through here? Does anyone have a question? I do. Yeah. Uh, uh, is there a better word instead of copy? Francois Lanc said to the King of Belgium at the Paris 1900 exhibition, um, j'ai uh, a reproduction en train. A reproduction. I think that's worse than copy. Worse. When I wrote the book on Linker, uh, which sadly we don't have here, um, 20 years ago, um, the man who I bought this whole collection for, uh, he came into my... Um, I was working at his house, he came into the office and looked over my shoulder and he saw this title, the, the, the Importance of Copies. And he said, I will not have the word copy in this book. So it was taken out. But I mean, a copy is a copy. I can't think of a better word. Can you, Helen? No, it's, that's what they are. So that's the only question about this awful word, copy. <laughs> because the point of buying copies is not to ask the people at the moment to buy the original. I'm sorry. I, so, what was the point of buying copies if the collectors had the money to buy the original? Because they couldn't buy the original. That's a very good point. It's a very good question. But the original didn't come. They still do come to the market. Now, right? They do, but, but um, if you wanted that, that's in, the, uh, in, the, in Chantilly. You can't buy it, the original. <laughs> you can't buy it. <laughs> and there's another one which I'm not showing, the, the famous Bureau de War in Versailles. Copies were made of that but you can't buy it, it's still in Versailles. So uh, the Marquis of Hartford wanted, saw the originals in 1853 and wanted copies made because he admired them. He thought they were very, very good, wonderful design and great quality, and he made, had them made at huge expense. Because for him, I mean, if the richest man in England who had all the money in the world was happy to have copies, why can't we? You know, if you like something, why not have it as a copy? Why, why say I can't have it as a copy? It seems to me the wrong, it's an old fashioned way of thinking, in my opinion. You but see, I have. You have, you have here in, in Lisbon the Fondation Philippe Spencer, which has, has a fantastic price. Yeah. But, but the price, I suppose, I never asked about the price, but it's I suppose the price of the pieces are of the time in the original, so no. or very close. I don't, th uh, no, I mean, this is a whole new story. No, I mean, uh, well, I think actually that's a good point. I think that the, the, the let's say the big uh, cabinet that the Queen has, the copy that I bought, um, it was, it cost the Marcus of Hartford 2,600 pounds to have it made, as I said, several million pounds. The original today would be 30, 40 million pounds. So it's 10% of the cross. Uh, I mean, it's, you can't play with that game. It's just impossible. If you can't have it and you want it, you have to have a copy made. I mean, it's, it's, it's a... The craftsmanship was mm. amazing. Oh, yes. The craftsmanship is every bit as good. In some cases, it's better in the 19th century. It's an arguable... And my wife and I argue about this all the time, but... <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Um. Oops, sorry, we go to... So yes, so now we're going to talk about the, the Belle Epoque. So this strange period, 1880s to, 19, to, the, to the First World War. Um, I was looking for, a, this book came out f uh, four years ago, and I was looking for a front cover, and I walked into a friend of mine's apartment. He said, come and see my new apartment. And there was my front cover. I couldn't believe it. So on, on the right of the fireplace is Eugenie, and on the left was the Emperor Napoleon. Um, and uh, just incredible. 
wonderful, wonderful photograph. I was so happy with that. So most, there are lots of Belle Epoque pieces here. This is part of this wonderful collection here in the museum. This one is by Emmanuel Zina. It's, um, oh, I think we've lost a slide. Okay, uh, this is by Emmanuel Zina, who is one of the greatest makers in Paris in the late 19th century. German born, like so many of the good craftsmen um, in the 18th century and the 19th century, Riesner was German, uh, BVRB, many of these makers were German, and so the tradition carried on. Many of the French cabinet makers were actually born in Germany or trained in Germany, as was Linke. So Zwiener um, often stamps his work like that underneath with a, what, a dry stamp, very common. But here in the museum, Maria showed me at the back, is this Zwiener Paris 1892 in the back of the um, marquetry, which is wonderful, very rare. I've only seen that once before. And just out of interest, there's another piece you can just, it's not easy to see, but you can just see ZN, Zine. And he marked the back of his bronzes. Not, I think, basically, so when the bronzes were sent, when the master models were sent to the, fo the founder, the foundry, they couldn't model them up, so they knew that they had the right uh, one, and they say, no, I want my one back, not Mr. Link's or somebody else's. That was for that reason, but it's very, very useful for us today. Here we have Durand, again, a signature. So this is the museum, again, the little flag. Um, so this is the front of this little cartonnier, beautifully made, and even the back is, has marquetry. All end-cut flowers, as they would have made in the 18th century, in the mid-18th century, exactly the same way, not using machines, all come by hand, and veneered this wonderful thing called court of veneering, one, two, three, four panels, uh, to give it depth and, and perspective. And that is signed on one of the drawers. So there's a little uh, pun on in English here, the connecting link or linker. Um, so there are several makers who all sewed, are sewn together by one designer. And this is a very important designer, Léon Messager, a French-born French Parisian sculptor who did lots of different designs. And these people, in no particular order, well, uh, Zwiener used him, and Boudet used him, and then slightly later on, Linke used him. Linke, as a young man, worked for Zwiener. And there's a connection between Zwina and Boudet. The only connection I can find is through this using the same designer. And that's stylistic. We don't have any proof. It's just my theory. So there's a very strong bond between, and these are the most collected pieces of 19th century furniture, uh, French furniture in the world. Everybody wants these pieces. And if it's not signed, everyone calls it Linka, even if it's not, because Linka is the big name. Um, this is a design of the piano that we're about to see by Léon Messager. It's not from the Kai, I don't think. It's from, it's from his book of drawings um, by Léon Messager. So he drew this piano, and it was made by, or now we know, by Jean Sen. Um, oh, sorry. So this is the piano in the museum, and I haven't got the slides together, but I'll just go back to it. You can see... You know, it's a sketch, but it's very, very similar, not identical. <coughs> and maybe the client wanted something a little bit different. In this case, we know who this client was. It was um, Solly Joel, uh, one of the rich, I think he was a diamond merchant, I think, a diamond merchant in South Africa. And he wanted this made. And is it by Linke? Is it by Boudet? Probably not. Is it by Zwiener? I don't think I would know the difference between Linke and Zwina in this case, except today I found out from you, thank you, because of the number, I asked very innocently, the piano has a number, all pianos are numbered. It has the number, and the museum here in their wonderful archives has the, uh, the full details of who it was made for, made in 1898 by Jeansen. So it's a name I haven't mentioned, why Jeansen? Because in 1893, Zwina retired, and sold his fond de commerce, his master models, to Jeansen. So Joel went there and had it made by um, uh, had it made by Jeansen in the same traditional way. So again, if if we didn't know that, and that came up for auction, which it won't, I hope ever, it would be all everyone would say it was by Linker, because that's the name they want. 
and here is one that Linker made, not Bernie Martin. And what I found was fascinating today that Jean said that Erard made this and sent it to Jean Sen en blanc, unpainted. So Jean Sen had it painted, we don't know by who, that's another, another research project. So there is, so Linker being, um, he was trained in the, what's now the Czech Republic, German speaking at the time, or Sudetendeutsch. His training was incredibly hard, like all the German craftsmen. They were really toughly, tough, their training, long hours, very strict. Linker kept records. So in the Linker archives, we know when he made this number, that was his record number, 1400. We, we can find the plans, we can find who, made, who did the bronzes, who uh, engraved the signature, the Linker signature. All the details there, it's quite unique, amazing. Uh, now here's uh, the other name I mentioned, Victor, um, Victor Boudet. This is, as you can see, is in the Ajuda Palace. This was my first real work here. Um, I think I came to Ajuda before I came here, actually. And uh, again, an, another treasure house of lots of 19th century furniture. Um, some well documented, and others not, uh, but all bought by the Queen, uh, who was, an, I think, an inveterate shopper in Paris, um, Queen, Mar Queen Maria Pia. Yeah, yeah. And um, so this is by Boudet, but again, if it wasn't, if we didn't know it was by Boudet because it's signed, it would be, um, people call it probably Linker. But it's the same designer, it's Leon Messenger designing all these pieces. His initial uh, impetus and the style is recreating this sort of Louis XV Rococo style in, in abundance. So any questions about that first, that section we've just had or are you okay with no questions about that last section? Yeah. Uh, could you explain the term uh, cartonnier? Cartonnier, shall I? Um, okay. Because we call cartonnier both to the Zwinner and the Durand pieces. Could you put uh, them on? Yeah, 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 sure. Okay, uh, um, go back. Oh. So this, well, the cartonnier is the top piece. So in French, cartonnier, just for, for carton, I think it's just made for, for files and things like that. So that is the upper part here, this little part here with these drawers, and they're beautifully made. They're called paper-lined. I mean, the, each drawer, if I could bring it down here, is a work of art. We could spend hours just looking at it. It's so beautifully made. And then with leather on the front, and all embossed leather with the gold, the gold embossing into the leather. Um, but this is called a cartonnier as well, simply because this is a bureau plat. And a cartonnier. So it's a, it's a, a writing desk or bureau plat with a cartonnier. And sometimes you see the desk by itself, made just as a desk by Zwina, but no, nothing like as good as this. This is almost certainly an exhibition piece. It's fantastic quality. And the fact it's got that wonderful signature suggests to me it might have been made for a very rich client or a special exhibition piece. So that's the cartonnier. It's simply the, the box on top. And you get it in low 16th style. This is obviously low 15th style. But nobody could mistake this one for anything but a Belle Epoque creation. It's not pretending to be 18th century at all. But you get other ones. There was one in the 1900 Paris exhibition by this maker, Paul Sulmani, who I mentioned earlier, which is an exact copy of one at Chantilly. Again, a copy. What about the mechanical features, the secret hiding? But uh, nobody can see that. Um, well, a lot of these things had, um, I think that it was a very much an 18th century tradition to have little secret drawers. And often you can't find them unless you know really exactly where they are. And I'm sure that was for love letters. What else would you do? You'd put your love letters um, in, in, in the secret drawer and hope that your husband or wife wouldn't find them. Uh, this is probably a lady's writing desk, so she was obviously you know, having a correspondence she shouldn't have been having, perhaps. Um, so, but they have very complicated secret drawers, uh, as this one does. So when you open this, uh, that allows these then to open, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. So you, when this... They don't have lockers. Okay, yeah, yeah. So that will unlock the, um, the top ones. Yeah. But again, when I look at that, uh, oh yes, Victor Boudet made an almost identical desk. So they were clearly swapping bronzes or buying them from each other or you know, saying, look, can I borrow your bronzes? I've got a client, whatever, we don't know. None of this was written down. These, although uh, these were very educa or educated, they were craftsmen and very skilled, they weren't really, apart from Linker, keeping papers at all. And thank heavens, Linker did keep all these papers. 
In my case, I uh, would say that too many German, very skilled cabinet makers were traveling and to Paris, and they were actually getting French nationality, like Winner and Linke. Yeah. Um, the they had work back in Germany, right? Mm -hmm. Can, um, could you all hear the question? You can all hear the question, Maria's question? So uh, the question is, why were people, why were all these Germans coming to France? Well, it didn't start in the 19th century, it started in the 18th century. Uh, Bernard von Reisenberg, um, Riesner, uh, the most famous of them all, the royal maker. Um, that, this is where the money was. Germany was lots of small states. Yeah, and France was a big, huge country, very wealthy when they weren't fighting, which they were most of the time. But my wife is much better qualified to answer this one. But, um, but they were really very well. I mean, you know, uh, German cars are certainly better than English cars, <laughs> probably better than Portuguese cars, and certainly better than French cars. They just, you know, the German technology uh, ingrained. They were just so very good at what they did. And they came to where the money was, where the work was. Um, what was very interesting, when um, I was researching my, the, the Paris book uh, many well, years ago, Helen and I were working in the, uh, the Ar Archive National, no, in the Bibliothèque, uh, anyway, one of the museum archives, and Helen found this wonderful piece of information that some German, a French count, had said during the 1848 revolution in France, all of the German makers were going in and taking bronzes off uh, from the um, Tuileries. They were trying to steal the bronzes to have things to make the copies during the revolution, which is an extraordinary piece of information. Thank you for that. That was great. We work as a team, although I'm much younger. I'm, 18th, I'm 19th century and Helen's 18th century. <laughs> so here's the Linka one and the Boudet. So Francois Linka. Um, I've done whole evenings, one day seminars on Linka, so I'll try not to be too involved with this. Um, it's, his, the, what he left, history, is extraordinary. And for me, as I said earlier, to have come here knowing there was some Linka furniture in this museum and walking in and finding those three pieces in the hall, which we'll go through in a minute, um, and they're all the most important pieces, was quite extraordinary. To think that somebody could have done this in the, this was the 1970s, wasn't it? These were, they were bought in the 1970s in London, I think, at Grouse. So they were bought in London in the 1970s when there was a lot of competition. There were a lot of uh, Arab money coming into London at that time. They were buying this sort of furniture. Um, he really must have known what he wanted. And what was fascinating, he was not shy to buy a copy like the, um, the Electro Bavaria desk, that's at the, Marcus, the Wallace Collection desk. So he understood the craftsmanship, he understood how important it was intellectually, and also for this Belle Epoque furniture and people like Linker. It was new, it was slightly outrageous, it was incredibly expensive and very, very good quality. So he wasn't shy to show that. It's so, you know, it's so easy to go to a museum, it's all 18th century, it's all 17th century. But you know, there's, there's 200 years ago. So this is someone who's really, he really understood how to. Um, create something unique, and it really is almost unique. There's, so, there's no other link of furniture of the type we're going to see in any other museum anywhere. I think there might be a very good desk in India, but it's been in the, in the subtropical, um, unhumidified uh, house, and it's falling apart. So, um, so it needs very careful monitoring, the humidity for this sort of thing. So this is, I didn't know who Linker was. I was, um, I was obviously quite a young man in 1976, and was suddenly put in charge of the department, and somebody wanted to borrow some money for this desk against, uh, uh, he said, look, we, I want to sell this desk with you. And Sotheby's at that time were doing what was called an advance, and he wanted a 10,000 pound advance for this and for a screen. In those days, we we'd hid that from the public, but nowadays it's, quite, it's common knowledge that people do that for a Picasso. Somebody wants 20 million up front, and Sotheby's or Chris's effectively buy it and guarantee that amount of money if it makes 80 million, then they share the money. Um, I won't get too involved in that, but at this time it was fairly unusual, and it was a real, very, very difficult for me to persuade my overall director to lend this money against these two pieces. And this was one of the first pieces I'd seen. And I thought, who is this man, Francois Linker? Nobody had ever heard of him. Nobody. Um, it was uh, quite a challenge. Anyway, the pieces sold, uh, I think we lent 10,000 pounds, and the two pieces altogether made 22,000 pounds. 
If that came up today, I know we're not we're in a museum and it's very academic, that would make £100,000 today if it came up as a copy. But it's not a copy though, is it? It's a recreation. And that was the book that I wrote in um, 2003 on, on, on Linker. And it was based on uh, the whole of his archive, which I managed to acquire for a, a rich collector who I was building up this big collection of Linker and other furniture. So this was discovered recently, it wasn't in the museum. I don't know where it was. I mean, I've been in the stores today, we keep finding pieces, and um, there's one piece you'll see at the end, which really got me very excited, which I'll show at the end. Um, so this was in the store, ignored, and uh, somebody got curious about it. <laughs> and uh, so it was, um, you know, and we were talking about it, and one of the ladies here said, sent me the photograph. Now, yes, I know this piece. And there is LF. Well, nobody knew who LF was, but it somehow got reversed in the mold. So that is the back of the bronze. Uh, I think it's uh, probably one of these here. So there, here's the Linker archive. So he had everything, or almost everything photographed. Everything, as I said, had a number, 153. Um, so that, I can go to the book, the registers. It's all listed in, pencil, in pen, who made it, how much it cost, and the total price, and how much he wanted for it. And in some cases, the man who ordered it. Um, but I haven't had time to research that one for here, but we will have a look at it. So on the back of the bronze, but, but again, I know this is Linker because I'm lucky enough to have on my computer all of these uh, about 2,000 slides, uh, old black and white clichés, they're called, of all his work, or most of his work, anyway. And he called this a Credence Louis, uh, Louis XV. So in his mind, it was Louis XV. But of course it's not. It's a complete recreation of, anyone know uh, Charles Cresson? A famous 18th century maker, uh, Charles Cresson. But it's nothing like Cresson's work. I mean, it's just using some of his ideas and reimagining them. So various signatures for Linker. Uh, we we'll start on the left. This is on the, is this the clock or is it the cabinet? I can't remember. It's the regulator. It's the regulator. So the clock we're going to see in a minute. Um, a very crude looking signature, but this clock, I'm absolutely sure, was made for the 1900 Exposition Universelle in Paris. So it's the first one, very important. I, I don't understand the signature, but it's perfectly genuine. As Linker got more sophisticated, and by the 1900 exhibition it became quite famous internationally, um, you had an engraving like this. So this is a copy of his signature, but engraved. And the detail is so much, we even know the man's name who engraved it for him, somebody called Atar, H-A-R-T-A-R-D. And we know how much it cost in most cases each time he charged. It's incredible. You might think it's useless information, but it's, it's wonderfully exciting to have all this. So, nothing like it exists anywhere in the world. And on the back, we've got a more conventional... Oh, sorry, this is on the back of one, another bronze, not here, I don't think. Um, F.L. Francois Lang. Again, like Zwina and Durand, for identification purposes, when you send the master model to the foundry, you want to make sure you get your model back. Because uh, you, um, especially in Linker's case and Zwina's case, this Germanic training, their master models were probably better than most in the world. They were really very, very good quality and very difficult and expensive to make. Because remember, it would be made probably carved in wood, this, this piece of bronze, and then made in plaster, and then it would be copied and be a mold, makes a whole new process. I won't get to take hours to explain. But it's a very complex process remembering that when, the when you've um, cast this, the bronze will shrink slightly. And these things, as you'll see in a minute, are so precise that you can't afford the bronze to shrink. So you have to put a piece of wax over it, and then the bronze, and then it's cast, and then the bronze just has a little bit, is a little bit bigger. I mean, it's, it's an incredibly complex and exacting um, job. And the... Yes, yes. Uh, nearly all of them are sand casts. Very rare, it's, that's another story, but wax casting was not done very much. It was more expensive and more complicated. Um, so you can see, um, you can see here, almost, you get a feeling. So this is using sand, so the, the, the bronze is poured into sand, 
and the sand is the shape you want it to be. You can almost see here the little grains of sand. But they use a very special sand. I don't know in Paris, but it, they use in England something from the middle of England, a particular type of sand, which is a grey colour. Again, it's highly technical. Um, so yes, sand cast. It's cheaper and quicker to do. Thank you for that question. Well, you don't, um, only by experience. I mean, this, um, this is not a good signature, in my opinion, of, of, of his, the middle, one, the middle one. I mean, the, the clock here is... It could be faked. Yes, it's often faked. It's often faked. When, um, when I started building up this big collection, I left Southerners in 1994 to work, work for this big uh, English billionaire. And I was going all over America buying things, and I bought several linker pieces with fake linker signatures, and I had the, the fake signatures taken out because um, it was ridiculous. And they were very, mostly not very good, but occasionally you're really not sure. But of course, I've seen pieces, especially in America. I remember going to a New York store. There were three different signatures from three different makers, and each dealer put a new name on it, but they forgot about the other names. You know, um, and it's crazy. Um, I'm sorry? Th no, 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 no. So let's say this table here um, was by was one cable, this particular one was by an English maker called Edwards and Roberts, a well-known English maker. It had, uh, somebody had put a fake signature saying Henri Dasson, a French maker, and at the front um, was Linker. And I could tell by this man's face uh, when I showed him the Edwards and Roberts and then the Dasson stamp, the dealer, that it was him who did it. It was quite clear. You know. I mean, he went very <laughs> red. Um, this is not encouraging you to buy furniture at the moment, is it? But uh, you, you have to be very careful. But in America, it was the worst. Um, well, actually, in Paris, too. Uh, I think Queen Maria Pierre was quite brave to buy in, uh, in Paris. But at that time, uh, you were selling the original reproductions rather than the fake ones. Um, so this is, of course, downstairs, and it's a major, major piece of linker furniture. Um, I, um, I bought one for my client in 1994 or 5 at auction in Paris. Luckily, the French, there was a big collection of French uh, 19th century furniture, an estate sale, sold on the day of American independence, on the anniversary, in Paris which is very sweet because none of the Americans, uh, they were on a holiday, so they didn't <laughs> bid. So I, I bought about half the sale. For my, so this, and that formed the, very the basis of the collection that I formed for this client. It was rather lucky. Yeah. Um, now, this is now I told you about the, how, I don't know how we're doing for time. I, 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 I told you about how Linker was, kept everything really, really uh, well recorded. This is Linker's pocketbook. He kept this in his jacket. And you can see he was a working man. That's his dirty, he's been working on the bench. Those are his thumb marks. That's when he's turning the page like that, all the dirt from the workshop. That is literally his fingerprint. Here is his, he couldn't draw very well, as you can see. This is his drawing. Bau, or side cabinet, Louis Cairns. His number, seven, 701, uh, made for the exhibition. And this is all of the different disciplines you can see there are, let's say, 10 or 15 different disciplines in making this. And each one, how much it cost and the total cost. So the total cost was, 22, let's say, 23,000 French francs for him to make the first one. And why do I think this was the one here in the museum was the first one? I know we've got a slight problem here. This is the lock on the cabinet upstairs. Or downstairs, downstairs. downstairs. Um, this is the lock, and it quite clearly says Exposition Universelle, 1900, Francois Lanc à Paris. That is a 100% guaranteed signature, and it clearly means it was the one at the, at the uh, 1900 exhibition. There's no question of that. The other signature is not very good. No, you're, you're right. It's not as good at, at all. For me, it's that is the reason mm -hmm. I would propose those signatures. 
the, the, but this was 1900 when he he was um, 50. He was 45 years old. And he managed to get enough money to have 16 pieces at the exhibition. You'll see the photograph in a second. He, it must have cost him so much money. He was not going to risk anything on this. It had to be the very, very best. As he became quite famous and quite wealthy, I think sometimes the standards might have, you know, he got quite old. He died when he was 94, and they were still making furniture at the beginning of the Second World War. And they buried all of the master models in the basement under the earth so the Germans wouldn't uh, take them uh, and melt them down. Um, so this is the signature, um, uh, the, the, the signature on this piece, uh, and it really is genuine. And what is so extraordinary about this, the lock is curved. So it's curved like this on Bombay and at the top. It's quite incredible. And what is fascinating, again, that, uh, you must stop me because I go on too much about Linker. Uh, Linker's brother made these. He was one of 12 children. His father was a gardener in the Czech Republic, what is now the Czech Republic, speaking Sudetendeutsch, uh, very, very different, diff difficult accent. And he, um, he, as the second child, was told to leave the house and try and earn some money. Then two of his brothers came over as he started to get established and worked for him in Paris. And so his brother made these wonderful locks. And some of the locks, this lock, uh, please don't take it out, but almost certainly is signed at the back by his brother. Yeah. Oh, I would think so, yes. Yeah. Um, and here's the, now this is, this is your point. Now, is this genuine or not? <laughs> this, is the, this is the copy, or not the copy, this is the reproduction that Linker made, explained to the King of the Belgium. This is the, the reproduction made, the one that I bought for my client. So you can see it's nothing like as elaborate. The detail is not as good. It's the same shape, the same fitting, but nothing like as elaborate or good quality. It's made, it was made two years after the original, by the same maker. It's like an old tune? Yeah, yeah, it's made by the same maker. So it's a, re Lincoln said it's a reproduction. If you want another one, I can make a reproduction for it. Yeah, yeah. This word is so difficult, copy, isn't it? Uh, one of these did go, but I'm not sure if this one went to St. Louis, yeah. So in 1904, there was a big, big exhibition in St. Louis, um, and... Uh, Zwina and Linker uh, sent a lot of pieces over. The British didn't send much, but the, the French makers did. But by that time, Zwina's brother had gone back to Germany, so the younger brother, and was working for the Kaiser in Berlin. And the Kaiser said, I want to show that we can do this as well as the French. So they sent an amazing exhibition to St. Louis. When Linker met the Kaiser in 1907, they had to speak in French because the Kaiser couldn't understand um, the su South German accent, the Deutsch accent of, uh, uh, of Linker. So, marquetry. Um, well, on the left is my one of the cabinet upstairs. This is all inlaid. It's lost a lot of its colour, as you'd expect. That was the original design, the watercolour for it. That's in the Linker archives that I look after. It, absolutely amazing quality, just beautiful. So that's the, uh, and I think your copy is, your example is probably better condition, I think. I think it's been less uh, in the sunlight. Sunlight, obviously, direct sunlight will affect these pieces. Uh, this is how this marquetry is made. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. Uh, is anyone familiar with this, how this marquetry is made? A little bit. Um, this is a, a friend of mine, a, a brilliant French restorer, Yannick Chastain. Uh, he was much younger then. And this is how it's done on a marquetry donkey. You sit and cut it by hand like this. I find it incredible that people can do this. And he does a lot of repairing, mainly of 17th century pieces. Uh, but this was just done for just an example to show what can be done. And then here you see the pieces. It's incredible. And he wrote a book um, when he worked at the Wallace Collection many years ago. And he wrote a book called Painting in Wood, which is obviously a very good title. Here we have the, one, another Pierre de la Résistance, of which there are many here. Um, this is the Linker regulator that's upstairs with that very, very chunky, if you understand the word, very heavy looking signature, it's almost crossed. I, I, I don't know why he did it like that. I find it very odd, uh, but it's a ge perfectly genuine signature. And I felt this was the perfect thing for the 
cover of my book. <laughs> it fitted, fitted perfectly on it. But this regulator is incredible. If, when you come back to the museum, because we're not letting you out without you promising to come back to have a look, look at the inside here. You can see behind the glass all the marquetry at the back. You can see as the pendulum swinging like that and there's all these beautiful flowers. It's incredible. No expense spared. And here is Linker's little pocketbook again. You see the, the, the mess on the, from his fingers. And it's again almost the same price, slightly cheaper than the cabinet we saw for him to make the original one. So, so, this, so what he would do, he'd know if he wanted someone, if somebody wanted, firstly he'd know how much it cost him to know how much he could sell it for. Um, and I would say it'd be about 40% more at the very least. And if somebody wanted to copy, he could say, right, okay, it costs 23,000 francs, prices have gone, uh, inflation's gone up, they're going to charge you a bit more or whatever. I don't know, but it's very interesting to have all that information there, exactly who made it. Um, is it about the signature? Ooh. No, Ciesler, that's the engraver. The wood costs 300 francs. The cabinet making, the woodwork costs 756 francs. So it's incredible detail. And this goes back to uh, Leon Messager, who really was, okay, he was using the best German craftsman, but Messager was the designer. Here is the clock in Messager's studio in Linker's workshops. He is making it up to, he's working out how the bronzes are going to work. He's sculpting the bronzes. This, I think, is probably a wooden carcass, just in oak, applied with terracotta. And he's modeling the terracotta with his fingers to get it how he wants it. And what's interesting, though, in Messager's workshop is this photograph of this cabinet. This photograph was made and exhibited by Zwina when the Eiffel Tower exhibition of 1889. So there is a direct, uh, if, if, you didn't, if you needed more proof, there is the proof that they work together. This is um, a chair, a chair frame, just to be used. That's a master model. So they use the master model on a frame to work out whether it's still going to fit and whether they need to bend it a bit or change the, the, the carcass. The wooden frame would stay the same, but they might chip away at the underneath of the master model. So that would be sent to the, it has LF on the back and a number, being linked, it has a number on. It would be sent to the, um, uh, the foundry and made and then um, come back for chasing and gilding. Here's just a piece that I wish I'd bought years ago. It came up in Paris. Uh, I don't know if this is by Linker or Zwina, but all four sides are different. So it's, it's a full-size little bedside table. All four sides are different. So you can show to the client, do you want it with these flowers or these flowers or these flowers? It's incredibly rare. They probably made these for every piece, but they've just been destroyed. And here is Linker at the exhibition um, in Paris, the Linker, uh, Linker exhibition. So you can see your clock and your Bahu there. And we're going to have a quick look at this. I think I'm running over time. Are you all right? Nobody's fainted yet. Um, so this is in um, the collection. Well, it's an antique dealer uh, has got this in London. He's had it for many years. It's nearly four meters high. This is Messager's drawing, life-size drawing. It's four pieces of paper in the Linker archive that I've had conserved, and they're all, they're all stuck together. So, so Messager had this hanging in his workshop so he could, with the model, could start getting the bronzes right, the right feeling of bronzes. So you can just see the craftsmanship, the time, the effort, and the sheer skill that's gone into this. It's one thing to draw it, another thing is actually to be able to make it. Linker was very exacting as he got older. If uh, a piece was made, it would start at the top, being made in um, the wood, and then go down as he got the bronzes on. When it arrived downstairs on the ground floor, um, he would have a look at it. He didn't smoke, but if he had, he'd get a, some of that cigarette paper out. If he could fit the cigarette paper behind, between the glass and the bronze, or the wood and the bronze, he'd send it back upstairs to be refitted. I don't know if he had a bad temper. He was just, uh, he'd been trained hard and he wanted his men to work hard for him. You know. I knew his grandson, but um, 
Who was? That was the great grandson who came here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, this I just took today, and they're not very good, but just to show you, on the clock upstairs, there's these beautiful little screws. They were brass, but they've changed colour because they haven't been gilded over the years. They've oxidised. And this is uh, on the side table that we saw earlier that's upstairs next to it. That has been replaced. This was in the London uh, trade. Not very sympathetically, and this is even worse. So the quality of these screws was incredible. When I was uh, buying this furniture, um, I had a little workshop and I had a restorer working, uh, restoring a lot of the pieces that had been ruined in America. And uh, I had 1,000 screws made in Paris so I could replace them all with um, proper looking screws. Uh, this is one of the, um, a big collector. This is a, a diamond merchant uh, called Mayer. This is a house in Grosvenor Square. Just to give you an idea what a whole Linka room would look like. Pity we don't have it here, but we don't. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, two of Linka's biggest clients, Mayer was one of them we've just seen, were Devoto from Argentina. He was the one who really got the railways going to bring the cattle into Buenos Aires, and then more importantly, the refrigeration on the ships to bring the beef over to, to Europe. So that was a Devoto who made a fortune and started a Linka museum in Buenos Aires but unfortunately died before it was finished. But you did, uh, in the 30 or 40 years ago, a lot of Lincoln furniture was being sold out of Buenos Aires into, the, the, into New York. Um, and another big collector uh, was Patino from Bolivia, who was the tin, obviously the tin king, and he made his fortune defending his own mine as a young man in Bolivia. And he also was buying. And Devoto was getting rather old, and he, Devoto wanted, had an, ordered a clock, the long clock from Linka, uh, but Pitino wanted one immediately. So uh, Linker wrote to Devoto saying, I'm sorry, yours is going to take a bit longer. Um, I, can't, you know, I can't finish it on time. So he sold it to Devoto, uh, to, to Pitino, businessman. This was also made for the Pitino house in Paris, in Avenue Foch. So he had this complete room, all made by Linker, for the, um, uh, in, in this Moorish style which is obviously very familiar in terms of um, Montserrat and the, the Alhambra. So it's the Moorish style into Europe and Patino. I don't know quite why he wanted Moorish style, because he was a Bolivian, um, but anyway, he did. And this whole room, and I met um, his, great, his granddaughter, who said, yes, I remember as a child, the whole floor was full with this Moorish furniture. But these are the only pieces that, uh, even the only photographs that exist. And you can see he's had his coat of arms put on there, or a coat of arms. Uh, this is Linker's, uh, where he was born. Oh, sorry, I've written twice, Linker. So this is where he was born in the Czech Republic, about 100 miles, 100 kilometers north of um, Prague. Very, very poor, 11 children living in that house. And this is, these are some of his tools. This is F. Linker, that's one of his uh, tools, a plane. This is one of his brothers, Wenceslas Linker tools, all in the Linker archives. What is really interesting, though, in the books, that's moi fait. So this proves in 1900, before they were, as they were working flat out for the 1900 exhibition, Linker, age 45, was still working on the bench to try and get things done. Here he is, age 16. Uh, I don't know why that was taken, because they had no money. He must have gone to Vienna for training, but we, we, we've lost that trace. And here he is um, wearing what I thought when I first saw it was a fez, because he'd been, he sold a thousand pieces to the King of Egypt in the 1930s, but apparently, no, it's a companion's hat. So all the work, the, cra the Guild of Craftsmen wear that hat to show they're the master, of, master craftsman. So that was a big mistake on my part. So there he is in his office many years later. And God bless him, really, for what he's done, for keeping all this stuff. Now, here we just have a slight diversion. We're back in uh, Portugal, uh, in the museum here, this desk. So this is the, uh, the library at Montserrat, uh, which uh, Helen and I went to yesterday. We simply couldn't believe how wonderful that building is. It's amazing. Extraordinary building. And the preservation, the work's been done to restore it, and all of the detail. So this was bought um, by, by your patron, by patron, 
uh, and it's now here in the museum. We think we know who it's by, a very important decorator called Crace. Here it is, you can just see it. Um, so he bought it from the, one of the auctions in the 1950s or something? 40s. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the museum collection now, so the connection with Montserrat. When I was being shown around the stores today, I kept getting more and more excited. The book I've just about finished, uh, coming out in March, is on English furniture of the same period. I've been looking, I knew about this cabinet. I've been looking all over the world to get a photograph of it. We walk into one of the rooms downstairs and there it is. Bought from the London trade in the 1970s. It's, uh, it's called the monoclier cabinet because you have one key to open it. Again, like the Germans, but it's made in England in 1839 to 1840. So I'm so excited. Please go and have a photograph of my new book. And, uh, and that is the, the book. It's coming out in March. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. for Pleasure. bringing A such pleasure. knowledge and I think we all uh, if, uh, we may have questions there are any more questions from the public so um, it's a very famous publisher called the ACC so yes I'm, will it be sold in the English bookshops uh, in Portuguese I'm sure it will be um, the Paris book as I wrote has also been in, written in French I've got a book in Chinese, if that's useful to you as well. Um, but, okay. but um, yes, this is the, this, they're very international. It's an English publisher, but very international. I'm sure it will be sold here. But it won't be, it was supposed to be out for now, for, the, for this talk, but getting the photographs today is a complete nightmare for an author. All them, everybody wants the money for it. This museum has given the photographs but many museums want money for it, and you just can't afford it. I mean, uh, it would cost me £100,000 just to get the photographs for this book, at least. Um, so um, it's very, very tough to, to get. Uh, and I think these books will disappear now. People just won't be able to afford to publish them. It'll all be on, online. Yeah. But for study purposes, we can all, always go to uh, Gulbenkian's library. He's amazing. So the question, the, thinking that the, the number of copies of British furniture, direct copies, yes, because there was no, as far as I'm aware, no big uh, collector wanting copies of Chippendale furniture, but there are some copies around. The problem is with, let's say, the most famous English cabinet maker, Thomas Chippendale, is that in the late 19th century, when you get the book, there are many, many pieces made in his style but they're pretty obviously not um, real Chippendale. They, they, they miss something. Hmm? These are followers of the style. Yes, it became very popular. I mean, the most dominant British style in the 1890 to about, well, to almost present day was the Chippendale style. So there were lots of copies made. Some were fakes, some weren't. And that's a very, very difficult area to work in. This Belle Epoque furniture that we have here was very rarely faked. They were genuine pieces made. Uh, the signatures might have been added, but not the actual, um, they weren't, it's too expensive. I mean, you can't copy that link a clock or anything. You can copy part of it, like I showed you, the vases on top of the, the Queen's cabinet. But they cost. How, how do you ex explain that French furniture is so rich and English furniture is so modest? <laughs> because we are a modest nation. Well, we are modest. England was rich enough, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, but, but, but everybody collected um, uh, the Boulle and early French furniture. All of the really important, or most of the, like in the Queen's cabinet, most of this expensive cab furniture went to the British uh, uh, aristocrats, uh, royalty, and the rich merchants. Huge amount of it, but they preferred it. They wanted this bling, they wanted the glitz, they wanted the look. 
Um, Sorry? Yeah, I think I think I think the telephone wants to go home. Well, we're very different nations, very different personalities. We've been fighting each other for hundreds of years. Um, we have a completely different sense of style and what we wanted. And um, Helen, can you explain that one? <laughs> I mean, we are just very different nations. You know, I mean, Portuguese and English, we have a sort of certain, you know, we're on the same time zone, <laughs> which helps. So we have a sort of feeling together. But and some of your furniture looks very English shape. And it's not so not always marked, just the rosewood pieces. So the French were trying to. Uh, we had just a completely different aesthetic. I think in the 18th century, it may be because the French had an absolute monarchy, and everything came out of the king. And they followed the king everywhere. And the king wanted to be grander and bigger and flashier than anybody else. Whereas by that stage, England had had a revolution. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, well, no, no, sorry, another question. Another question. Could you please go back one or two slides? Yes, that's it. I'm seeing some inspiration on Thomas Chipman Jail and Director. 100%, absolutely. This, the cornice here is it's yeah. not direct. You won't find exactly that in Chippendale, yeah, but, it's, but, it's very, but it's very similar. Because they adapted it to fit what they, you know, in their, they, thought, they didn't think they could do better. They just wanted a different look. And this happened to be a different shape, etc. So all this is Chippendale style. And that is, this was made by somebody called Thomas Sopwith in Newcastle in the north of England. And their family later made the, the fighter planes in the First World War, the Sopwith biplanes. So, uh, and, and, and this becomes very exciting for my new book, is that all these cabinet-making firms in 1914, they switched to making uh, aeroplanes and things like that. It's very interesting. Yeah. It's another, another lecture next year. <laughs> so, yeah, that's very much top of Thomas Chippendale. With, very odd with the clock in the middle, but anyway. Yeah. How can a cabinet maker turn into an airplane engineer? So, the, the lady was asking, uh, asking about how can a cabinet maker make an. No, they weren't engineers. They, so, the engineer would draw the plans. And remember, these First World War airplanes were made of wood. They weren't metal. They were made of wood. So the cabinet makers were making them. And the propellers were sometimes four blades like that, made of mahogany. And I have a little bit of one at home. And they're all mahogany layers glued together and bent at the right angle. And the very, only the best cabinet makers could do that. Otherwise, the plane wouldn't fly properly. And some of the ladies were making the, were putting the, 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 the canvas over the, the canvas wings. Over that was done by the ladies and painted. And also they were making boxes for, for the bullets and things like that. So the whole in British furniture making industry was made over to, um, to, to that. And my grandfather um, had a, a, an antique shop and workshop in, at that time. And he tried to get one of his workmen to stop him going to war because he was needed to fix the blackout blinds on the windows, so that because uh, they thought the Germans were going to bomb everywhere, they didn't, mm. luckily, and uh, not not in that war. And so, uh, I, I think he went to war and possibly died. I don't know, but so it's very interesting how you know these. Some men were allowed to stay to make the planes; others had to go and fight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Oh, you, you have. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you next time.